Hey everybody, welcome to another AATRN talk. Today we have Sarah Percival, who will be talking to us about computation of Reeb graphs in a semi-algebraic setting. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, thank you. Thanks to the organizers for inviting me. I'm really excited to get to speak at this seminar today. Uh, my name is Sarah Percival. I'm a postdoc at Michigan State right now, working with Liz Munch, um, among others. And this talk is about work that I did as part of my thesis. I graduated from Purdue just about a year ago. Um, and my advisor there is Shogata Basu. And I would like to thank him, especially for posing the questions that led to much of this work, as well as his guidance and collaboration throughout this project. Today, I'll be talking about uh, computation of Reb graphs in a semi-algebraic setting. First, I would like to start by giving a visual abstract of the punchline of this talk. The idea is if we start in the top left of this triangle, if we have an input set and a map, we want to somehow topologically simplify this. One way to do this is the Reb space shown on the top right. And our main goal is to get this top middle arrow to get the Reb space or more specifically the Reb graph from our input set and map. And the way we're going to do this is we're going to use the concept of the road map, which was introduced by Canny as um, a tool for robot motion planning. We're going to leverage pre-existing algorithms for computation of road maps to uh, end up with the red space. So for starters, I would like to discuss the setting that this research takes place in, which is semi-algebraic geometry. Semi-algebraic geometry is also known as real algebraic geometry. Um, this was born out of a desire to study real solutions to polynomials with real coefficients. Throughout this talk, I'll be working over a real closed field R. This is a field such that R is not algebraically closed, but when you add in the square root of negative one, it is. If you're unfamiliar with real closed fields, you can really think of working over the real numbers throughout this talk, especially since this is an applied seminar and uh, real world data often is real valued. So you really won't lose much by thinking about real numbers instead. Uh, however, I wanna point out that these results hold in this slightly more general setting. And the reason why we choose to work with semi-algebraic geometry is because this framework allows us to take advantage of pre-existing computational results. Uh, more specifically, uh, there has been a lot of work done both in the area of robot motion planning, um, as well as other computation of invariance, and we can then leverage these efficient algorithms to compute other topological structures. The building blocks of semi-algebraic geometry are the semi-algebraic sets. This is the smallest family of sets in RK that contain the algebraic sets, which are defined by polynomial equalities. Uh, it also contains sets defined by polynomial inequalities and is closed under complement finite unions and finite intersections. So the picture to the right here is an example of a semi-algebraic set is defined by uh, the circle, which is the blue arc on top and a parabola, the green arc on the bottom. And we say that a map uh, between semi-algebraic sets is semi-algebraic if its graph is a semi-algebraic set. So the reason why I believe semi-algebraic sets are an appropriate setting for applied topology is that the class of semi-algebraic sets is large enough that it includes pretty much any set you may encounter working with real world data. However, it is small enough to exclude uh, the sets that are often very difficult, the kind of sets that tend to be counter examples to conjectures. So um, it's a really nice family of sets to work with. In addition to what I said earlier about this structure allows us to leverage pre-existing results in algorithmic semi-algebraic geometry. The main focus of this talk is on the Reb graph. So the Reb graph can be thought of as a one-dimensional simplification of a topological space or semi-algebraic set. 
Uh, this was first introduced by George Reb as a tool in Morse theory and has recently found use in applied topology because it can track the connected components of level sets of a function. So formally, if we have a semi-algebraic set and a continuous semi-algebraic function from our set S into R, the Reb graph is a quotient space where we identify two points if and only if their image under F is the same and they're in the same connected component of the fiber. So below are two examples of Reb graphs on a solid torus. On the left, uh, we have a torus and the function is sort of the upright height function. The level sets are denoted in red and the way we construct the Reb graph is we look at each level set we look at the number of connected components. And in the case between the bottom of the torus and this hole here, the level sets have only one connected component. So there will be one point in the Reb graph. Then when we hit the circle and split, there's gonna be two connected components in each level set, which are highlighted by the two connected components over here. And then again, the top of the torus is similar to the bottom. If we take the very same torus though and turn it on its side and look at the height function, because it's a solid torus, the pre-image of each point is just going to be an annulus, which has one connected component. So the Reb graph is just a straight line. So this shows that the Reb graph depends both on the input space as well as the function from S into R. And furthermore, these two Reb graphs are quite different in the sense that they're not even homeomorphic. If I'm going to use the term Reb graph, I better justify uh, that the Reb graph is actually a graph. So it turns out that in some cases, Reb graphs are not graphs, nor are they semi-algebraic sets. For example, if we look at the punctured disk with the height function, the pre-image of every point is going to be just one connected component, except at this equator here where we have two connected components. So the resulting rub graph is going to be the line with two origins. This is not a graph and it is not a semi-algebraic set. However, if we restrict ourselves to looking at proper maps, that is inverse images of compact sets are compact and, and semi-algebraic maps, then the resulting Reb graph will be a graph and it will be a semi-algebraic set. So from now on, all maps here will be assumed to be proper semi-algebraic maps. There is a generalization here uh, called the Reb space of a function. So this is almost the exact same definition except our function f, instead of requiring it to go from our set into r, it can go from us, our set into any other semi-algebraic set. So given a set S and a map F from S into any other semi-algebraic set, then the Reb space of F is the quotient space where we identify two points. Again, if their images are the same and they're in the same connected component of the fiber. So here's an example where our set S is a disk and our map F uh, is the map that sends the uh, boundary of the disk to a point. The resulting set here, X, is a sphere. And to compute the Reb space, we look at the pre-image of every point in X, and we see the pre-image of every point is itself a single point, except for the North Pole. And the pre-image of the North Pole is a circle, which has one connected component. Therefore, that will get identified in the Reb space. So the resulting Reb space is also going to be the sphere. Reb spaces and Reb graphs have been investigated from both a theoretical and an applied perspective. Uh, the notion of Reb spaces appeared back in the 70s. Uh, these were called the Stein factorization of a bivariate generic smooth map. Uh, to my knowledge, the first mention of the Reb space with that specific terminology uh, is from 2008, where it was defined for um, a multivariate piecewise linear mapping. 
And I also want to highlight Mapper, which is a discrete approximation of the REB space of a multivariate mapping. Uh, in practice, Mapper is used quite often. And one of the strengths of Mapper is that uh, since it's an approximation, it can take as input uh, point cloud data, which doesn't work so well for REB graphs. Uh, now I'd like to highlight some applications of REB graphs, because after all, this is an applied topology seminar. And so I think it's really important that our work is motivated by applications and vice versa, um, that our work maybe inspires new applications. So the REB graph has been used to simplify um, metric graphs. And this is of particular importance to me. I work with a computational biology group that is uh, very interested in studying graph structure um, and learning sort of what is the underlying structure that's happening to maybe elucidate uh, biological phenomena. And so good at all, by using the REB graph in their algorithm, we're able to uncover the underlying structure of a metric graph um, and this algorithm was very flexible. It uh, worked where several other algorithms were not able to take as input a metric graph um, for simplification. This one did. And furthermore, using the REB graph allowed them to recover the structure more accurately than other algorithms. Another algorithm or sorry, another application of REB graphs is the algorithm uh, developed by Fuscucci et al. to compute REB graphs of meshes. And an interesting result of this is that they were able to use this algorithm to find uh, little topological defects in meshes that were previously thought to uh, be sort of smooth or clean. I also use uh, REB graphs in the form of Mapper in my research here at Michigan State. Uh, I work with uh, two plant biologists, Dan Chitwood and Amanda Husbands, uh, to use Mapper to study the shape of leaves. In our current project, we're building a Mapper graph on a set of over 3,000 uh, Passiflora leaves. And we do this because we're interested in the interplay between developmental processes determining leaf shape within a single plant and the evolutionary processes between species. This is still a work in progress, but on the right is a preliminary figure from one of our papers showing a mapper graph built on this point cloud data and how it sort of elucidates differences in leaf structure. In particular, we have this one branch here that sort of signifies that there's maybe a sub-morphotype of this morphotype A. So now going back to a more theoretical setting, I mentioned earlier that we wanted to leverage algorithms from real algebraic geometry to study REB spaces. And in order to do that, we need to make sure the REB space itself is actually um, a proper semi-algebraic quotient. So along with my advisor and a fellow graduate student, Nathaniel Cox, uh, we found that the REB space of a semi-algebraic set and map is homeomorphic to a semi-algebraic set. So this is really good news. This sort of justifies the semi-algebraic setting and allows us to now ask some computational questions about actually computing this REB space. So there's a meta theorem in semi-algebraic geometry relating the topological complexity measured in terms of Betty numbers of a set to the complexity of a function to compute that set. So before we get on to actually talking about algorithms, we want to talk about topological complexity as measured in terms of the sums of Betty numbers. So there's a theorem for REB graphs that states that the sum of the Betty numbers of REB graphs is less than or equal to the sum of the Betty numbers of the original space. Uh, this is a really nice theorem to have, especially since the idea of REB graphs as a simplification tool, we would wanna make sure our 
simplified set is indeed more simple than our original set. And this is sort of what this theorem is saying. However, this theorem does not generalize to rev spaces. If we look back at our disk and sphere example, we see that the original set, the disk, has a sum of Betty numbers of just one. However, the sum of the Betty numbers of the sphere is two. So this theorem doesn't generalize. And in fact, if we look at products of maps, then the sum of the Betty numbers of the rub space can actually grow arbitrarily large compared to the sum of the Betty numbers of the original space. However, not all hope is lost. There is a theorem that states if we have a proper map on a connected set, then the first Betty number of the rev space is less than or equal to the first Betty number of the original space. This is very nice, especially again, because in applied settings, we often are really only concerned with uh, first homology. So this theorem is very useful in this context. And then we were able to prove um, a singly exponential upper bound on the sum of Betty numbers in general. So if we have a bounded semi-algebraic set and a map from S into RM, letting a small s denote the number of polynomials defining s, and if we bound the degrees of the polynomials defining s and f by d, then we have a singly exponential upper bound of the sum of the rev numbers in terms of S, D, as well as the dimensions N and M. So this is actually really good news because now this opens up the idea that there should be an algorithm to compute the rev space that has singly exponential complexity since the sum of the Betty numbers also has singly exponential complexity. So just to recap this meta theorem, because we have a singly exponential sum of Betty numbers in terms of the polynomials defining our set S, then we should have a singly exponential complexity algorithm to compute uh, the rub space of S. Now I want to define um, what exactly complexity of algorithms means. So in our setting, the complexity of an algorithm refers to the number of arithmetic operations performed by the algorithm, and this is measured in terms of S, which is the cardinality of the set of polynomials defining our semi-algebraic sets, D, which is about on their degrees, and K, which is the dimension. Now, we actually are all semi-algebraic geometers, whether we know it or not, because in our lives, we hopefully have all added two polynomials together. This is an example of an algorithm in semi-algebraic geometry. So if we have as input two polynomials and we wanna compute their sum, what we need to do is add each coefficient to each other. And it turns out we need to do that uh, P plus one times where we're assuming P is the higher degree. So in this case, our complexity would be P plus one since we're performing P operations. And this complexity is measured in terms of the degree of the polynomial. Now, when dealing with algorithms more generally, we don't necessarily care about the exact number of operations required because that often varies a bit depending on the input data set. Really, we just wanna know is the algorithm constant in terms of the inputs? Is it linear? Is it polynomial? Is it exponential? And for that, we introduce big O notation. So for a real valued function, we say that F is O of G of X. If there is a constant M such that the absolute value of X is bounded by M times G of X. And we say that an algorithm has singly exponential complexity if its complexity is bounded by O of two to the N to the K for some constant K and doubly exponential complexity if it's bounded by O of two to the two to the N to the K. So to the right is an example uh, showing the difference between singly and doubly exponential complexity. 
Even for very small values of x, the difference is still quite large. So it's very important that we're able to find something with singly exponential complexity rather than doubly exponential complexity. And the reason why we're sort of benchmarking against uh, doubly exponential complexity is that many things can be computed by first triangulating our set and then using a pre-existing algorithm to compute whatever we want to compute. However, triangulation has inherently doubly exponential complexity. So even though maybe from a theoretical point of view, it would be uh, not too difficult to write such an algorithm down on paper, when it comes to complexity, this algorithm uh, doesn't do so well. So that's why we're so focused on finding something with singly exponential complexity. A lot of previous work has been done in uh, trying to compute uh, Reb graphs and Reb spaces. Uh, so Dora Swami and Nadarajan developed an algorithm to compute a Reb graph of a piecewise linear function. This is a very fast algorithm, much better than singly exponential complexity. And Tierney and Carr uh, produced an algorithm to compute Reb spaces of uh, piecewise functions. Um, this, so now what we're doing is we're working in the semi-algebraic setting. So this um, work, our algorithm that we're about to present works for more than just piecewise functions. It will work for any semi-algebraic function, which in practice, sort of in the applied setting, would be really any function that we may run into. And it works over uh, any semi-algebraic set, which again, in practice, this sort of covers all the cases of anything we may run into when working with applied data. So our theorem states that there is an algorithm that takes as input a family of polynomials describing a semi-algebraic set and, and a map, and it computes as output a semi-algebraic description of the Reb graph with singly exponential complexity measured in terms of the number of polynomials defining S, their degree, and the dimension K. So when working with Reb graphs, I just want to point out something that makes our lives a bit easier. So without loss of generality, we can restrict ourselves to the case where we're working with the projection map. So I showed an example earlier that the Reb graph is highly dependent on our map of choice. However, uh, we can, given a uh, set, any semi-algebraic set and any semi-algebraic map, we can find another semi-algebraic set such that the Reb graph of our new semi-algebraic set and the projection map is the same as the Reb graph of the original set and map. And the way we do this is we add a new variable and we consider the augmented set where our new variable y is equal to f of x. Now f of s is the same as the projection of s prime onto r. So now we can work with S prime in the projection map instead of our original set and map. And this is just a nice fact. It allows us to prove things a bit more easily since now we can just think about projection maps. Uh, the main tool in our uh, algorithm is the road map. This was developed as a tool in robot motion planning. Sort of the idea is that if you have a robot in a space with some obstacles, the robot needs to find a way to get around those obstacles. A road map, as shown on the right for the torus, is a semi-algebraic set of dimension at most one, which satisfies the two road map conditions. That is, uh, every the road map intersect with the original set is semi-algebraically connected within each semi-algebraically connected component. Um, let me pause here and just say that uh, the definition of semi-algebraically connected is really very similar to the definition of a connected set. Just sort of replace all the sets with semi-algebraic sets in the definition. And then the second roadmap condition is that for every X in R, and semi-algebraically connected component D prime of this fiber, um, we have that the intersection between our roadmap and every uh, 
semi-algebraically connected component of the fiber is not empty. So here is an example of a roadmap of a torus. Um, so this has only one connected component. So uh, roadmap one, condition one holds. For roadmap condition two, if we look at a point um, anywhere along this x1 axis, and we look the set at the set S sub x, we see that our roadmap uh, meets the two connected components of the torus. And one nice property of the roadmap is that as we go along this x1 axis, the number of connected components of the level sets change only finitely many times. So it turns out the roadmap of a set is not unique. Here are two examples of roadmaps for the torus. However, both of these examples satisfy the two roadmap properties. So any roadmap that we generate in our algorithm is going to be sufficient for our purposes. Our proof also makes use of Puiseux series. So this is sort of a really interesting tool that allows us to construct a field whose unique order is the one that makes this infinitesimal epsilon positive and smaller than any other positive element of R. So this is again, sort of a cool um, thing we can do with semi-algebraic geometry. And um, really the takeaway from this slide is that we can now work over a field that has an element that is positive and smaller than any other element. That, uh, sm sorry, smaller than any other positive element. All right, so now I'll just give a sketch of the way this algorithm works on the torus. Um, so our first step is to uh, obtain the roadmap of our input set. There is already an algorithm to do this that has singly exponential complexity. Our next step is to go along this x1 axis and between each uh, critical value where the number of connected components in the level set changes, we select one curve per connected component. So um, in this first interval here, uh, there is one connected component of the torus in each level set. So we select one curve. Between these two critical points, there are two connected components of the torus in each level set. So we uh, select two curves. And then again, this last interval is similar to the first interval. So this relies heavily on the property that between these critical points, the number of uh, connected components in the level sets does not change. And this curve selection also, it's essentially random. It doesn't matter which curves we choose, as long as we choose one per connected component. Now we're going to make use of our infinitesimal epsilon by uh, taking the curves, truncating them by epsilon, and attaching them with a straight line. So over in our torus picture, this looks somewhat like this. And our resulting set is something that is homeomorphic to the Reb graph of the torus with a projection map. And the reason why we sort of do this infinitesimal chopping and connecting business is that we want to get this commutative triangle down here. There's more than one way we could have attached these curves to get something homeomorphic to the Reb graph but we need to do it in this specific way so that this triangle commutes so that we can say we have um, a semi-algebraic description of the Reb graph. And the set gamma here is what we obtain through this algorithm. The complexity of this algorithm is dominated by the complexity of the roadmap algorithm, which has singly exponential complexity in terms of the number of polynomials defining S, their degrees, and the dimension k. Uh, future work is to generalize this algorithm to compute Reb spaces. So we have an algorithm to um, compute Reb spaces using very similar techniques. However, it's doubly exponential in k. This isn't the absolute worst scenario since in practice, k is often no more than three. However, because of this meta theorem that 
says that since the sum of the Betty numbers of a Reb graph can be bounded singly exponentially, that we should have an algorithm to compute the Reb space with singly exponential complexity. We do believe that such an algorithm to compute Reb spaces with singly exponential complexity does exist. And that is um, ongoing work to find that algorithm. So these are some of my uh, references in particular. Oh, um, right. So there is a paper that was just uh, published actually in discrete and computational geometry. I haven't updated it here, um, detailing our work showing the singly exponential upper bound on the sum of the Betty numbers of Reb spaces. And here are some other great references to learn more about this topic. Thank you.